Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another live episode of Let's Talk on your favorite channel, Huda TV. I'm your host, Arkham Rashid. Remember, this is a live episode, so our phone lines will be open throughout this show so you can join us. So in this episode, we want to speak about popular culture and its effects on people. So let's start off by welcoming and introducing our panel. On my right hand side, sir, if you can give us your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself. Go ahead, inshallah. My name is Baraka Blue. I'm an artist, poet, hip hop, a musician from the Bay Area, California. All right, Baraka, and this is your first time on the show here with it me. Is. Um, well, you're in Egypt for a little bit amount of time. Um, how are you enjoying your time in Egypt so far? I love it. Um, beautiful people. I've, I've been told that the Egyptians have the best sense of humor in the whole Arab <laughs> world, and I find it to be true. <laughs> all, right, all right, I'm glad you're enjoying your time here. Uh, once again, uh, welcome to the show. Mm -hmm. uh, next to him, brother, if you can give us your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself. Go ahead and yeah, My name is Yusuf Kroma. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'm an author, activist, spoken word artist, all around nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we got, we got the poets on this side of the panel. Right, right. All right, all right. Uh, Yusuf, I'm going to once again welcome you to this panel and the show, you. inshallah. I'm going to come over to this side. Uh, brother, if we can get your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself. Go ahead, inshallah. Uh, my name is Idris. I'm from America, from Amer Maryland, same area as you. <laughs> um, here, um, teaching English, studying Arabic, and memorizing Quran at the same time. Mm -hmm. All right, right. We got Maryland, Delaware, mm -hmm. and Philadelphia on the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, next to him, brother, if you can give us your name, where you're from, sure. and a little bit about yourself. Okay, I'm Omar Khaled, an Egy Egyptian, and I work in translation and writing scripts for TV programs. TV programs. All right, Omar Khaled. Once again, welcome to this panel and this show. Uh, this side of the panel, I, you guys are usually my guests, and we have wonderful conversations. <laughs> so I'm also looking forward to this uh, conversation here. Um, so coming to this side, let me start with you, Baraka. Let's start with a very simple question so we can kind of lay the foundations for this program. What is popular culture, and what does it mean to you? Mm. Pop culture. A lot of things spring to mind. Um, Michael Jackson, first <laughs> off. But that kind of dates myself, so... Probably for the younger people, it would be more like Beyonce or uh, Lil Wayne or Drake. <laughs> but um, yeah, popular culture is, in American context, you think of the big Super Bowl halftime mm -hmm. and the big uh, fanfare and uh, music television and all that. But I was also thinking about the fact that that doesn't necessarily have to be pop culture. So I've had the blessing of traveling a lot. And in some of the places that I went in very traditional Muslim cultures, pop culture is actually um, qasidas mm -hmm. and nasheeds and remembrance. And the, the famous people are the shiyukh and the scholars mm -hmm. and the righteous people. And I really think that you could tell a lot about a society by the people that are put on a pedestal in that society. Yeah. So who do people look up to and who are the superstars and the famous people right. mm -hmm. and so I think it, you know obviously in the West we think of pop culture as something which perhaps has a corrupting influence or there's a lot of negative and it's a lot of just heedlessness personified and magnified but in reflecting on that I would say it doesn't necessarily have to be that that's not reflective mm -hmm. of all cultures <coughs> Mm. So uh, different cultures would have different sort of popular cultures amongst mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, which would lead to another question is how is pop culture created? But before I do that, I want to put the first question to Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf, if you can tell us what do you think pop culture is and what does it mean to you? I think any culture and then it was a social construct. So it was like an unspoken agreement between the civilizations of people that reside in society, which is that what is to be done, what is to be said at a particular time and place in a circumstance. And that, you know, it shifts. Something may be popular now, something may be cool now, and tomorrow it's not. So it's a way of dress, it's a manner of speaking, it's, you know, a way of carrying yourself, or, you know, a joke, a way of joking. Yeah. So is this something that's unspoken? And once that thing is crystallized by way of repetition, by way of like widespread practice, then it becomes popular culture. Mm -hmm. So I believe it starts in like the underbelly of the city, you know, something's happening, mm -hmm. and then it becomes practice widespread, then become popular culture, or it starts from the top and it trickles the way down, i.e. Beyonce wears a new wig or something <laughs> like this, right? 
she does wear wigs. All <laughs> right, or something like this, and there's a new trend, or somebody wears a new hat, you know, that places it this way, like Baraka's hat is gonna go live, right? Mm -hmm. And they're watching it like, yo, man, I like that hat. Mm -hmm. And then all the, you know, guys. Catches the trend. Exactly. Yeah. Creates so, the trend, actually. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I believe that's, you know, how popular culture is, and it's just, by way of repetition and emulation, it becomes popular culture. Either way, you know, from the bottom up or from, or from the top. From yeah. the top down. That's very interesting, actually. I'm gonna come over to this side of the panel. Idris, what's your thoughts on this? What do you think popular culture is? And if you wanna give us some points on how do you think it's created as well, that'd be good. Uh, for me, I think I'm, I'm pretty simple, uh, a little bit of what they're saying, but a different angle. Mm -hmm. For me, it's popular culture, of course, it's a culture from an area that's put forth and uh, Push to be uh, popular by different outlets, may, may, whether that be media, whether that be uh, athletes, whether that be someone. They're the ones who are putting forward the idea to push something to be popular, because mm -hmm. they're the ones who who will influence it to become popular. Mm -hmm. Not just because I do it, it will become more popular, because certain people or certain me uh, out uh, outlets push it forward to make it popular, mm -hmm. and people tend to gravitate toward this. And of course. In the world right now, the West is, has the power, the influence, so their culture is dominating and, and going forward, and people are, 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 are sort of trying to emulate it because they're the ones in power. And um, that's a pr pretty much for me. And, and yeah. it's interesting that you mentioned that because you can see the effects of that trickling throughout society around, around the globe. I mean, mm. a lot of the youth around the globe, whether whatever country they may be from, want to be like Americans. Mm -hmm or want to be like the British. And you can find that amongst themselves, and that's because of the effects of popular mm -hmm. culture. Um, we, c we can, inshallah, get into whether or not y popular culture can be used in a good way to influence people as well. But before I do that, Omar, I'm going to get your thoughts on this as well, so yeah. you can yeah. join the panel. I, I just wanted to add just one point. Uh, sure. I was reading an article that was talking about America and about the standards mm -hmm. of what's right and what's wrong. So it was talking about movies rating, and the rating of movies. Mm -hmm. They were saying that at the time, maybe maybe in the 80s or something like this, some of the scenes that are considered violent at that mm -hmm. time will be considered right now, maybe it's something mild and it's nothing. And PG-13 stuff now, yeah. maybe are not even shown in uh, rated R uh, movies right now. I think it's due to something in psychology also, which is related to desensitization, because we get desensitized to things that are repetitive. Like when we, we see, see sex and, and, and drug and rock and roll and all of these things, mm -hmm. and we get used to them. Uh, like ask a person who is, they are rare, but there are some people they don't like mm -hmm. to watch maybe TV that much. You want, they like reading, they like socializing with the families. Ask them and tell them, what do you feel when you listen or hear, like for instance, there is a war in a certain place and some civilians dying. Maybe they can cry, maybe they can feel shocked. And you can, you, we, most of the people are gonna feel like they are weird, why are they crying? Why are they mm. be having these feelings? While this is the normal way of behaving as, as human beings. So f for me, I, I don't tend to be gloomy or something, but for me, pop culture in general um, makes us, most of us, d don't, don't have feelings. Uh, this is mm. maybe... Okay, is that, that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, that's why this panel is here. You can share yeah. your thoughts and whatever you, you feel about uh, the topic. Uh, now, what I want to ask is, do you guys think that popular culture is always necessarily a bad thing, or can it be a good thing? And if it can be a good thing, how can we use that to influence the youth in a good way? Uh, Barack, I'm going to start off with you. Um, I don't think popular culture necessarily uh, is a negative thing. Mm -hmm. um, although when you say pop culture, I do think of the kind of negative heedlessness, mm. like you said, <coughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll, mm -hmm. and all that. But it, when you guys were speaking, I was reflecting on the fact that you know, the Muslim Ummah mm -hmm. uh, span from Africa, Spain, Southeast Asia, uh, Anatolia, China, and all across so much of the world. And when you look at someone like Ibn Battuta, who came as a judge from Morocco, and then he was able to be a judge in all these places, yeah. right? Because he studied fiqh, right, in Morocco, but that was he was able to function, you know, all the way in Southeast Asia. And, you know, they talk about European travelers that if they would uh, leave just a few days from their city, they were in a totally different culture. Mm -hmm. And it was like, this is, right, Marco Polo talks about how even still in Europe, but outside of his city, mm -hmm. it was foreign to him. And so I, I reflect on, like, 
there was this kind of global Muslim popular culture, which is a lot of it is based on the prophetic sunnah, how you treat people, mm -hmm. being generous, hosting mm -hmm. guests. That was pop culture in a sense, right? And that was just how people were raised and how people learned about it. And even many people, um, you know, that I talk to today that are from, you know, Southeast Asia or Pakistan or East Africa, they'll just be like, this is how my family and my culture does things. And then later in life, they'll learn, actually, this was a prophetic sunnah. Mm -hmm. They'll just think it was their culture, mm -hmm. right? So it's the popular culture that it actually creates such a beautiful atmosphere and, and passes on these teachings. Mm -hmm. So I think pop culture in and of itself is a neutral term. The question is, what is the content of the popular culture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's actually very interesting. And, and to get a specific question, which I'll come back to you for, is that what about Muslims living in the West, mm -hmm. like in the U.S., Europe? Uh, the popular culture that affects the Muslim youth, is that always a good thing? And do you think parents should be concerned about that? Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to go to Yusuf and put the same question forward that um, do you think popular culture is always a negative thing? And why does, it, why does it seem to have this negative context to it? No, I think pop culture, like anything else, has its pros and cons. Mm -hmm. But when I reflect particularly on the climate in the United States, something that's pop culture now is activism. Yeah. Right. So you have the Black Lives Matters movement, you know, and people raising arms against the government, uh, fighting the powers that be, uh, disproportionate distribution of wealth and resources, mass incarceration, um, you know, poor educational systems, just all across the board. And that's popular culture, you know, hashtags. Mm -hmm. So anything that happens, the youth are active, the youth are ready, they're ready to protest, they're ready to have sit-ins, and that's popular. So I think that's something that's, that's praiseworthy within itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, those moments within pop culture, I think there are, there are goodnesses that can, can be taken from, um, from those sort of moments mm -hmm. within pop culture. And that's, ver that's very interesting. And and something like that, we need to know how can we create that sort of pop culture. Like you said, going back to, there's so many things that are amongst the culture of many Muslim countries that they didn't know right. was a prophetic tradition. Sure. And when you tell them, well, you know, well, being generous, this is actually from the Sunnah of the Prophet mm -hmm. And they're like, wow, this is our culture. But it trickled down from there. Like you said, you know, sometimes pop culture comes from the highest part of society, trickles down to, to even the lowest parts of society. Uh, Idris, I'm going to come over to you on this side, uh, put the same kind of question to you, <coughs> pros and cons, and do you think uh, pop culture is necessarily bad? Um, I, I agree in the sense that I, I don't think in, if in and of itself is a bad thing, yeah. because as we know, uh, Allah created everything, and everything He created, nothing is 100% bad. Hmm. Even Iblis gave us uh, a dua that we benefit from this mm -hmm. to this day, mm -hmm. and um, of course we know the status of Iblis. Mm -hmm. yeah. So nothing in itself is always bad. It's just you need to put an Islamic lens through it for, so for to say, a, a filter mm -hmm. through it to, to, to figure out what, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Because the problem is that a lot of times that the we want to use a filter that is not from us yeah. to determine what's right and what's not right. We like to use a filter that the West considers, like they would call us sometimes they love this term to say you're a fundamentalist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in reality, this term um, uh, 75 years ago wasn't a bad word. Mm -hmm. But the connotation came from the, 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 um, the uh, evangelistic Christians. They, they started calling them fundamentalists to demonize them. Mm -hmm. So this term actually came from something good and it turned to bad. Through their lens, through their history, through the things they went through. So we have to learn how to take things for what they are and take the good and leave the bad. This is the problem with a lot of the, the Muslim West is that mm -hmm. they don't have this lens and they often end up taking the evil things and leaving the bad mm -hmm. because they're using the West's lens to determine what's good, what's bad, mm -hmm. which we shouldn't do. Yeah. Um, and, and that's exactly, I mean, when you use somebody else's lens, you're basically playing on their playing field. Mm -hmm. uh, Omar, I want to ask you something very similar. Uh, your thoughts on this, but give us an example from Egypt. Oh, well. <laughs> 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 okay, I, j I just uh, wanted to start something popped in my, my mind uh, regarding... Of course. Uh, yeah. thing. It's, uh, I think it's a quote by um, Mark Twain. He's an American mm -hmm. author. Uh, it was something like this. If most people are going somewhere, mm -hmm. then pause and reflect. Because most people, maybe in, in most time, mm -hmm. they are just following something called the herd psychology. Mm. When, when we do something, for what instance... What we call sheep. <laughs> 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 yeah, because they did so many experiments regarding this, yeah. like 
it's it's a long experiment, but I'm not going to get to it. Mm. But it's regarding like no, not dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not torturing okay. dogs these days. <laughs> <laughs> but it was regarding like monkeys. If if you want me to to say uh, it, like, not uh, monkeys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead and tell the story. But wait, it, there's torture in it. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the story in the end that the they brought f five monkeys inside a cage, mm -hmm. and the the when they brought something like food from the, the ceiling of this cage, mm -hmm. and when one of the monkeys tried to get this banana or something, they they shock the, the other four uh, monkeys. Mm -hmm. So what happens that after time when when they see this like uh, connection between the, the monkey getting over like yeah. a box and getting the, the banana, oh, this is the, the reason for for this shock. Mm -hmm. So they stop him. They stop the the, the monkey and bring him down. Mm -hmm. What happens? that he, the monkey doesn't understand what's happening because he's not on the floor at that time. Mm -hmm. The floor that, that, that he's getting the banana and so mm -hmm. on. So they try to change the monkeys and they remove one after the other until five monkeys, they are not even, you know, they don't yeah, know the they, experience. They've never been shocked. They have yeah. never been shocked. Mm -hmm. And they, when they see one of the monkeys Go getting up, going up, the they follow that's just mm -hmm. the pattern. They, they, they just hit the, the monkey with it. So maybe this is what I wanted to, to allude to. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the question about, um, um, Egypt, um, well, I think most m most likely, like uh, like the brother said, that the Twitter and Facebook and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth mm -hmm. changed uh, so much of the apathy and, and the misunderstanding of what's right and what's wrong. Because now, mm -hmm. it's it's a good thing and a bad thing at the same time that some people lo just lost the hope, and lost the trust for authorities and for mm -hmm. like um, some of the the elder like. Uh, people because the, the, there is a detachment. There's a detachment mm -hmm. between them and between uh, youth. So they start to get the information themselves. They start going mm -hmm. and read and re discuss this with each other. Mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah, and that, that detachment that you mentioned, that's, that's what we're going to speak about next. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think there's, there's sort of a gap of understanding between the youth and, and their, their parents' generation, especially in the West? And, and now, you know, hearing this in Egypt as well, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't even know this about <laughs> Egypt. Uh, <laughs> But do you think that gap is there, and do you think that it will affect the way the youth practice their religion? Because they don't want to take the religion of their parents. Mm. That's not cool. That's mm -hmm. not pop culture. And then after we tackle this issue, we'll probably get into how can we create a trend that the youth or the Muslim youth mm -hmm. would want to follow. So let's start with this first one. Do you think there's this gap that exists, and how can we overcome this gap? Go ahead, Paul. That's a great question. I think the brother alluded to the fact that in the West, now in the modern world, there are people that are manufacturing culture, mm -hmm. right? So there are people, you know, multi-million dollar companies that are saying, you're part of this demographic, you're part of this demographic. Mm -hmm. So people think, I like to listen to this, and I like to wear this, and I like to use this slang. But they don't know, actually, they're part of a demographic that lives in a specific neighborhood, in a specific age bracket and a specific socioeconomic status mm -hmm. and that actually those likes are kind of manufactured by these huge companies mm -hmm. so okay there's that going on and a lot of that is they separate ages so they're like you're gonna like this music and then then ten you know five years later you guys are gonna like this and you're gonna like this and so it does create a definite disconnect and I think um, one of the most important things is that there's communication between the age groups um, mm. and I really reflect on the fact that in traditional cultures the elders were honored mm -hmm. that we you know these are our superstars mm -hmm. because these are people that have wisdom and have experience and we honor them and in the West you know in fact people dread getting old Mm -hmm. Right. And old people are trying to look like their children. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're trying to dye their hair and they're trying to get rid of their wrinkles and they're trying to mm -hmm. right, dress in the new hip fashion. And that's part of the pop culture. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right. And it's like my mom has a term for it. She said painfully hip like you're so hip, wow. but it's like just you're trying so hard. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I really feel that we have to be able to really think about the ways that we can nurture a a healthy culture because in some sense you know nowadays it's like children are spending more time in front of machines than with their mm -hmm. physical family members or even physical friends and so who's raising who you know so these are things that we really need to think about and we need a question like can we uh, just say it's all bad or do we need to be interacting with these mm -hmm. things that youth are, are interacting with in ways that give a you know 
positive outlet or a beautiful representation. Yeah, um, yeah and I mean, just that last point there, th that's something I completely agree with. I think that uh, we need to understand the popular culture in order for us to appeal to the youth. Mm -hmm. in order for us to educate them in a better way because if you're not going to do it somebody else will right. and that popular culture will be there and that popular culture will take an effect on those children and on the youth. Uh, Yusuf I'm going to come to you uh, same kind of question uh, something interesting that he mentioned was that there's major players yeah. that are deciding who likes what do you agree with that? Absolutely mm -hmm. uh, you find in the states I mean it's, it's all systematic and it's also it's so pervasive that you can't escape it Really, you know, for example, in popular culture music, if there's certain a certain genre of music that you don't like, right? There's certain rappers I, I just can't stand. Their message is corrosive, is and I can't stand it. But I'll be ironing my shirt and I find myself humming the lyrics or something like that, because you know I heard it so much that it's stuck in my mind now. So that's how you know it's, it just sticks to you like glue. You know, after a while you can try to you know evade it as much as you can, but after a while you still take on some of that influence mm -hmm. some of the effects of the popular culture. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the du'a, I think Islam comes to address the condition of the people. Mm -hmm. So there was one particular da'i who spent 10 years in a particular region studying, you know, Sharia, studying Fiqh and Quran and things like this. And he stayed there for 10 years. He never came back to Philadelphia. Yeah. So when he came back, <laughs> he really didn't know how to address the condition of the youth. So for every problem, it was like, you need to learn Tawheed. You need to learn more Quran. You need to memorize the Hadith. And you youth like, nah, man, you know, we, we can't relate to that. So you didn't know how to address the popular culture and, you know, and address them in a manner that they understood and address their particular condition. It's like a doctor who, if you go to the doctor, he, he just generally looks at your symptoms and give every per sick person the same mm -hmm. medicine. When really you need medicine on an individual basis and understand the different symptoms, the different climates and things like this. Uh, so you can give them appropriate medicine for the condition. So I think that in addressing pop culture, our Islamic leaders, our uh, elders, it is necessary to a certain degree for them to understand the conditions that we're living in, the things that we're going through, mm -hmm. so that that gap is, is, you know, is closed. And at the same time, it's our responsibility as youth to honor the elders for the sake that they're elders. And they don't need to like put on a hoodie or some skinny jeans for us to say, yeah, I'm going to listen to this elder. Yeah. They need the respect because they had the experience mm -hmm. and they have the credentials and they've been where we've been before. So I think that it's a, you know, it's a a sort of, yes, yeah, a mutual yeah. common, common ground sort of mm -hmm. thing. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, uh, before we continue this conversation, we're going to go for a short break, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Let's Talk. Now, before we went for that short break, we were speaking about popular culture and its effects on people. Uh, something that we spoke about right before we went for that break was the gap between the older generation and the youth. And how can we close this gap that's between and that's there? Uh, Idris, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Idris, what I want to know is, do you think there is a gap? And should this gap be closed in order for the, the elders or the scholars or the people that are preaching to the youth for them to understand the youth better and to know how exactly they can relate to the youth. Yeah, I, I think there is a gap. It's, it's pretty obvious there is. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, the solution would be, we have precedents in the, in the, in the Sharia and in, in, the, in the history of, of, of mm -hmm. Islam of this exact same thing, where sometimes people would come from another land yeah. and come talk to a scholar and ask him for an opinion. Mm -hmm. And he would say, ask them where they're from. And when they found, he found out where they were from, he said, you have people in your area that know better than me. And some of these were the giants of Islam. That yeah. You would think that they, they probably know the answer, but they would send it, that person back to the person who's, who's knowledgeable of the area. Ask them. They know your area, your people better than me. But, we, but I think the biggest problem is that um, it's not easy to find an individual who has the ability to still have an understanding of where he's from and still get to a certain level of Islamic knowledge where he can actually, you know, disseminate the, the, the Sharia to them. It's not an easy task because mm. sometimes, often, this person lose balance mm. w while seeking the knowledge. They intend to be so uh, engulfed in it, they forget where they're from, they forget the people, they forget the reality. Mm. Similar to the story. So I, 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 I live close to Philly, and I've been to Philly plenty of times. Mm. I'll give you an example. Is you know, uh, some of the things we talked about before, like for instance, some people don't know that, you know, of course he'll, he'll laugh because he's from <laughs> Philly. 
in Philly, the beard is popular. Yeah. yeah. You will think uh, th everyone's Muslim when you go there and, and <laughs> come to find out it's not. Mm -hmm. But this is the popular culture from there. Mm -hmm. So the Philly uh, gear, they got the, the yeah, Muslim yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. Exactly. <laughs> very big. You'll see yeah. it's very a lot of people with the big beards. It's just a normal fat fashion thing there. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a scholar may see this and think, oh, mashallah, they, they really have a lot of people. But in reality, he doesn't not understand the culture of the people. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean anything to them. Yeah. Well, to, to the ones who do it for the reason, it means something. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them doesn't mean what you think it means to them. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, just a cool thing. Yeah. Something that they grew up and this is what they're, no they're used to. It's normal mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. So we need people who can put these two together, which isn't an easy thing. So I'm not saying it like, oh, like as if we're just throwing it out there. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult thing. You have to keep a balance. Like he said, the guy went away for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Probably he should have came back mm -hmm. and spent you know, some time in, 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 his, in his town in, with his people and then go back, back and forth, so that he doesn't lose the touch with wh wh who he is, mm -hmm. and he can put the connections together. Mm -hmm. Something you mentioned in the beginning was that uh, many times a person might ask a scholar for an opinion or a fatwa, mm -hmm. and he would say, where are you from? And if he finds mm -hmm. out he's from a different land, he would say, go ask somebody there. Uh, it reminds me of something we did in, in, uh, in Kitab al-Qadi. Mm. Uh, where it speaks about the rules on being a judge and what are the conditions and one of the conditions that was mentioned and this is a traditional book mm -hmm. was that the person has to understand the culture it's oh. a shot wow, it's a Allah. condition meaning this person coming. cannot be appointed as a judge yes. if he does not understand the condi uh, sorry wow. the culture of the people that he will be judging because so Urf is, uh, is, is, is one of your uh, mm -hmm. exactly and, and it's not even something like well it'd be good if he understands no. the col uh, culture Shari. It's a shart, meaning he will not be appointed qadi. Yeah. He will not be appointed the judge of a town or whatever area if he doesn't understand the people and their culture and how, you know, how they roll. Um, I want to come to you. Oh wait, before that actually, one more thing <laughs> I wanted to mention which reminds me was the Philly beard. Mm. And this example is very interesting to me because something like this, for example, whether or not you're keeping your beard for a religious purpose mm -hmm. or whatever it may be, or because mm -hmm. it's style in your city, but the tolerance is there. Mm -hmm. So in Philadelphia, if somebody wants to keep a big beard mm -hmm. because they're religious, they can, and it's not looked at as something weird. Mm -hmm. Whereas, let's take Egypt for example, oh. if you keep a big beard, it's looked at as something weird. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. culture is not there, that culture is not created. And that's what we want to address. How can we create a culture where the youth will feel comfortable practicing their religion? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but before you move on, there, a, lot, a lot of times the youth are going to have to understand something mm -hmm. too. That the Prophet told us that That's we would be strangers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you would be strange. That you're going to have to deal with it. You don't have to feel like I have to fit in. You're going to have to deal with that. You know what? This is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. This is what He gave us. And popular culture will sway to the left, sway to the right. Mm -hmm. But you need to be firm. Mm -hmm. And does it matter if you're strange today? Mm -hmm or strange not to yeah. but you need to speak, stick firm to what, to what will get you the jannah, to what please Allah. Yeah. If, we, if we have that principle, you'll have a better understanding in, uh, of how popular culture will affect you yeah. and how you react is more important to have than how it affects you. Mm. Yeah, and, but, the, but the thing I'm trying to aim here is that, uh, or aim for is understanding that, yes, for example, if the popular culture is against our religion, mm -hmm. then you stick to the religion. But if we can make it uh, uh, in a way that both of them line up with each yes. other, then that's what we need to aim for. We mm. need to try to create that culture in which the youth will feel safe and will feel proud and will feel comfortable practicing their religion. Uh, Umar, I want to get to you and, and let's get some examples from Egypt coming in here. Come <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, before saying an example, I remembered something regarding the culture and understanding this when we are a judge. Mm. Um, yeah. I remember an incident happened to the Prophet, may peace and blessings be upon him, when at the time, after even fa the conquest of, of Mecca and so on, um, he, the Prophet said to Lady Aisha that if it wasn't for your tribe and your, mm. your families, mm. that they are just very close to being disbelievers, I would just deconstruct the Al Kaaba right. and just build it again. Absolutely. But he wouldn't do this. Why? Because he knows that their culture, they're going to understand, oh, now. He is now changing the, the culture of his, mm -hmm. <laughs> his tribe and so on. So he understands this and he makes uh, like for it, like, takes it into consideration. So this is something that we have to take, take into consideration. About Egypt, um, I have a general solution in my opinion. Um, to change the culture, you have to change home. This is the first nuclear mm. change. If, if 
the house is not changed, then the, the, the whole culture is not going to change. Mm -hmm. What I mean by this is that fathers, they are, and especially fathers, they are isolated from their kids. We don't learn experience about life except from people who just engage with other people outside in life. So if my father, that, that happened to me actually, my, if my father is, my father lived in another country and then mm -hmm. I didn't get to uh, like experience with him and so on. So I'm not going to understand the, the, the real world around me and what's right and what's wrong and how to deal with the differences mm -hmm. and how to stay firm in your, in your principles. At the same time, you deal with good behavior with people and don't make them feel like uh, they're reluctant to deal with me and so on and so forth. So the first step here is to have a very good relationship with uh, the sons and daughters, like mm -hmm. the father and the mother, of course, to get closer to them mm -hmm. and to, to know that we understand you. We mm -hmm. understand To you. close that culture yes. gap. But this is the beginning, before knowing the scholars, because the scholars, we know them when we are older, when we are maybe after being teenagers and so on, getting to the critical t age. So it starts at home. It's, mm. it's my Education opinion. starts at home. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, the next thing we want to tackle, and this is probably the last issue that we'll be able to speak about on this show at least, is how can we create a trend for young Muslims to follow, and how can we kind of counter the bad popular culture, we can say. Uh, Barack, if you can start us off. Uh, that's a great question. I read a paper called Islam and the Cultural Imperative by Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, mm -hmm. who's an American scholar, and he used an amazing uh, analogy. He said, Islam is like a pure spring on the top of a mountain, and as it flows through different lands, it maintains that pure water, but it takes on the color of the bedrock that it flows over. So if it's that's red true. clay, mm -hmm. you see the red culture, and if it's, if it's a you know, blue rocks, it takes on a blue color. So he said in West Africa, Islam looks African. In Southeast Asia, it looks Southeast Asian. And that's a beautiful thing. And he mentions that the Prophet wasallam was not culturally predatory. Mm -hmm. In other words, he, he didn't look at different cultures and say, that's not us, that's not this. In fact, uh, it's mentioned that the Prophet wasallam when he went to, to different tribes that would braid their hair, he would braid his hair like them, to honor them. Mm -hmm. Or when he went to tribes that spoke in a different Arabian dialect, he would speak like them, to honor them. And there's many other stories like that. So one thing is that, but at the same time, Islam obviously doesn't just say, everything's cool, everything goes, right? There's, there's a Furqan. Right, yeah. there, there, so anything that is, in it, but basically, the default is things are good unless they go against the sacred mm -hmm. law. And... You know, one of the things that's fascinating is we're talking about pop culture and we think about in America and probably in the world, we think about hip hop music. And so much of hip hop is associated with negative things, you know, uh, heedlessness, you know, lower desires, money, greed, violence. And in many ways it's been weaponized, but I kind of come from an era and probably some of the brothers here in which a lot of the hip hop was actually very conscious and very positive and actually Islam was very central. So the first time I heard the word Allah was in a hip hop song, <laughs> mm -hmm. in Wu-Tang Clan, right? It's and then, you know, <laughs> the reason that I read the autobiography of Malcolm X is because all the rappers that I looked up to were talking about Malcolm, were wearing X hats, were sampling his voice in the records, they had his face in the music video. And I was embarrassed as a young kid, 14, 15, that I didn't know who he was because that's who the rappers were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so then I read his book. And these were very central to my entering Islam. And so, you know, but now you see how, of course, hip hop, like I said, has been weaponized and it's, you know, being used as a tool to lead people astray. So I'm saying a lot of stuff because it's not necessarily simple, like how do we do that? But yeah. we have to look at culture as positive, as good in and of itself, but then those things which go against the haq and go against what, you know, the deen has taught us, that we then kind of purify. Islam is to purify things, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily against. And a lot of times I think, you know, people in the, in the Eastern lands, in the Muslim lands, they see Western culture as either like so enticing that they just love it, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. wearing blue jeans. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times they take the worst aspects of our culture. Yeah. You know, they don't take the good aspects because there is a lot of good in Western culture, but they take the, the negative. And so, you know, I think the key is that we know our text well and we know our context well, which mm -hmm. is what essentially the brother was saying, that we know the dean well and then we know 
the our culture well because then we won't get confused it won't mm -hmm. be so difficult to sift through but again that takes some real literacy some real education mm -hmm. and uh, like you also mentioned it takes some real cultural context because if you come uh, from a strong family and then by extension a strong community a strong masjid or what have you then you're gonna have some immunity to the negative effects of culture but if you don't have, if, if no one taught you how to be, mm. how to be a man, how to be a woman, how to treat people, how to respect people, what type of things we should be looking at and listening to in a beautiful way, then all that stuff is going to, you're going to have no immunity to it. And it's just going <laughs> to, you know, mm. sweep you away. Yeah. And, and very interesting that you mentioned that. I love the analogy you gave in the beginning of uh, your speech here. Uh, one thing very important is that Islam didn't come to destroy culture. Mm -hmm. And that's what many people get wrong. Uh, what they do is, okay, now you want to start practicing Islam. <laughs> so first thing you do is what? Put on a thaw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think that's going to make you oh. a religious Muslim. Or and a shawar kameez. Exactly. Or, or anything <laughs> that looks like you know, something that a Muslim mm -hmm. would wear. But that's not what Islam is. Islam didn't come yeah. to destroy your culture. It didn't come to Arabize your culture. It didn't come to do anything to your culture. The only thing it came to do is that those aspects of your culture that are not good, it came to change those. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when the Prophet and the, the, the early companions, when they converted to Islam, mm -hmm. the Prophet didn't tell them, okay, now that you're Muslim, right, we're going to wear a different thobe. Mm -hmm. No, they continued wearing what they wore. What did they change? How did people recognize that that person is Muslim now? Because the, the mushrikeen, they were able to tell, okay, this person has taken the religion of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. How? Behavior. Behavior. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. The person's character and his manners changed. Mm -hmm. Not the way he dressed. He didn't wear a different thobe that the person said, okay, you see that thobe? What? That's the Ummah of Muhammad thobe. Mm -hmm. That's not what it was. Mm -hmm. It was his behavior, his manners. This person used to cheat. Now he doesn't cheat. Mm -hmm. When this person used to sell, he used to rip people off and lie. Now he doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. He's taken the religion of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. That's how they told. And that's, how, that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. When you want to become practicing, you don't need to change the way you dress. You don't, I mean, obviously, unless it's <laughs> something inappropriate <laughs> in Islam <laughs> itself. But generally speaking, if you, if you wear jeans and you wear a shirt, you don't need to throw on a thobe. And that's, but you need to change your behavior, your character, the way you interact with people. And that's mm -hmm. what the difference is. Mm -hmm. um, Just one quick. Of course. The, the, this is why in Islam that uh, your, your behavior at that moment will be so heavy on the, on the scale of judgment. <laughs> mm -hmm. M more so because... If you did all the salah, you did uh, all, all of these things that benefit yourself, it benefits you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when you do, you, you know, have proper uh, manners and adab and akhlaq and all of these things, you don't, you don't affect yourself. Yeah. Adab doesn't affect me. Yeah. It affects everyone else. That's why on the Day of Judgment, a lot of people are going to find themselves in trouble. They're going to be in a lot of trouble because their behavior will overshadow that they prayed uh, all their five prayers. It will over overshadow that they did this. Because it's a huge thing, so. You're going to be bankrupt. <laughs> yes, muffless. <laughs> Did you just say taxi drivers? <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Yusuf, I'm going to come over to you. What's, what's your thoughts on this as, uh, as well? How can we create, so, or sort of create, because obviously creating a trend, yeah. is, it's, it's a whole conversation mm -hmm. itself, or probably even more. But how can we start to counter bad influence? Yeah, I think if you look at the Prophetic tradition, and that when at the advent of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ went to who? The most influential people within Mecca. So he went to the people of influence. So within any type of culture, any society, people emulate people of influence, people to have, whether it's wealth, whether it's power, whether it's just, you know, you're just somebody that's known. So you utilize people of influence, and uh, within the communities, those should be our Islamic leaders. So for example, one of the key reasons I'm even here, I even, you know, even considered Ashar, was a, a graduate of Ashar that was back, I met in, uh, in LA. And when I saw the brother, he was dressed very, very well. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, almost out of a GQ magazine, like fresh, right? So I'm like, yo, this dude, like, you know, he's, there's something about him. He's like, you know, very, you know, well put together. There's something nice about him. And then later, after speaking with him, I found out like maybe a day later that he was an Ashar graduate. He was an Alam as well. So I was, you know, automatically drawn into him, his character, mm -hmm. by the way he treated me. And then I found out later that he was a person of knowledge. By that point, I was already in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I was already influenced by his character without him even telling me, read this thing. hadith, read this anything. I already wanted to know what he was about. 
So by just being a person of influence, by having good akhlaq, and also being a little bit sharp too, <laughs> you know, you can, it, it doesn't hurt. You can influence society by being a person of influence. Mm -hmm. So if we can, alhamdulillah, take these people that are in societies, whether they're artists or authors, people that have, have influence, and help them, uh, enable them to, you know, sort of work on that akhlaq, as opposed to demonizing them for uh, something that they may have, a rap or something like that, you don't like a lyric, enable them to accept Islam, people of influence, those are the people that can have massive impact. You know, as opposed to demonizing culture, sometimes you refine it. If something, like you said, not everything is 100% bad. So if an individual has some bad characteristics, we refine those. We don't say, we're done with you completely. Yeah. We help you refine those characteristics, and then you will enable you to influence other people. Because I may have better characteristics than you, but if I don't have that network, if I don't have that outreach, if I don't have the influence, it won't do that, you know, that, that uh, it won't be that much influential as if it's someone else mm. had those same qualities and could just refine the little things that they had and fixed it, they would be far more influential. Yeah, um, unfortunately that brings us to the end of our episode, oh. but before I do that, I just <laughs> want to comment something interesting you said was uh, that, you know, people look up to these people mm. and what comes to my mind is parents. Parents. parents are the first mm -hmm. people that a child looks up to and if parents start start off with this good behavior like you mentioned earlier yeah, sure. then you know it starts off in the home education starts from the home uh, so with that being said I want to thank you guys for joining me <laughs> on the panel that's today that's well, we had a wonderful conversation I was you know satisfied and dear viewers I hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation join us for many more episodes and don't forget to check out our Facebook page and YouTube channel until then May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.